Good evening and uh, welcome to Behind the Headlines. Today is Wednesday the 10th of November 2021 and in this programme tonight we'll be discussing uh, the French President uh, Macron's ambitious plan to create a European super state and on the eve of Armistice Day um, that took place 103 years ago tomorrow uh, on the 11th hour at the, on the 11th month um, we saw that the armistice agreement was signed that ended the bloodshed that was the First World War. So we'll be asking, will Macron's plans to create a, Euro to create a European army lead to a European superstate? Um, Reagan, it's good to see you. And I, I, I see you wearing a military tie that you've got on yeah, today. Right, you poppy as well. Th this was um, given to me by my friend who was uh, in the Navy back in the... I believe it was the 50s, early 60s, he was in the Navy. He was on a minesweeper. Uh, his name is Neville. He's 82 years old, so a shout out to Neville. He occasionally comes across it randomly while scrolling through his channels. Uh, but he gave me this tie a few years ago. Excellent. So, Neville, I hope you're watching tonight because we uh, want to pay uh, tribute to you and to your colleagues for the great sacrifice that you paid for our freedoms in the Second World War. And that's a fab fabulous generation. Um, well, tomorrow is Armistice Day. And, uh, you know, this is a day that uh, we've had for 103 years um, in which we remember the end of the bloodshed in, mm. in the First World War. Um, and the signing of the armistice agreement. Uh, and this is why we effectively wear the poppies, um, mm. because they grew out of the, uh, the battlefields of Flanders, the only mm. thing that grew despite the, the carnage of four years of carnage, which not only changed Europe, but it reshaped the entire European order and almost shaped the entire globe. We, we saw the loss of the Austro-Hungarian empires. We, we saw the end of the Ottoman Empire. And um, we saw the emergence, really, I think, of the United States as a major power and also that of the Soviet Union. So the First World War did change and shape everything. It set the tone for the rest of the century. We had um, communism uh, really begin to r rise up out of the newly fledged Soviet Union. The SARS were ended. Um, we, we look at how really in Germany after the First World War the economic collapse and other struggles also laid some of the seed for um, a very angry young failing artist um, by the name of Adolf Hitler to rise up and become one of the most evil dictators the world has seen. And um, so it, it really did change the, w the world. Um, and set a tone for even greater changes that would follow um, around 20 years later. Absolutely. So if we look at some of the figures here, um, the First World War took the lives of 9 million soldiers. Mm. 21 million were wounded. And according to our own National Archives, over 886,000 British soldiers lost their lives. We see that uh, nearly a million civilians have died in that conflict um, and five million died from disease or starvation. And the First World War was termed the war to end all wars. We know it didn't because of what happened uh, two decades later, but it is a, a reminder of the uh, incredible sacrifice that was paid by so many um, in the First World War. Uh, the price then that was levied uh, against Germany during the um, Treaty of Versailles in 1919 brought total economic devastation to Germany and that laid uh, really the seedbed for uh, what would begin to transpire in uh, the Second World War. It would lead to the rise of Nazism and uh, then of course we know uh, the millions who lost their lives as a result of that. So hardly the war to end all wars. It, uh, if you look also at the increased isolation of the Soviet Union from the rest of the world from uh, that point, that also uh, it had a massive, massive effect on the entire century. And 
doubtless as well on other parts of the world where we see that there was inspiration taken um, from the Soviet Union. So you, you can uh, take a lot of where we're at in the world today, a lot of the traumas that people are bearing. You're, you're talking about um, you know this philosophy that went global, that affected and messed people's lives up in Cambodia, in Vietnam, in, um, in Cuba, it, it, um, sought to take over the entirety of Korea, um, thankfully just North Korea, um, but, but tragically North Korea and the entirety of China. So you, you're looking, you know, we'll talk about um, the impact of um, Nazism and uh, the defeats uh, by and large of Nazism. Of course, there's evil um, neo-Nazism that continues to this day to some degree, um, but there's still these struggles and these heartaches out of um, the socialism and the uh, very closely attached communistic ideologies um, that were spawned in the time of the First World e War. Exactly, which came out of the, uh, the Red uh, mm. Revolution, the Communist Revolution in Russia in, yeah. Yeah, on the 17th of, August, uh, 17th of October, I think 1917. That's right. um, earlier today, I, I did an interview with uh, Major Rhett Parkinson, who's the uh, director of the Armed Forces Christian Union, as we mark the 103rd anniversary of what is known as Armistice Day. Uh, we're now joined on by the headlines uh, by Major Rhett Parkinson, who is also the director of the Armed Forces Christian Union as we're on the eve of Armistice Day. Mm -hmm. Um, Rhett, it's great that you can join us on Behind the Headlines. I, I'm actually loving the medals that you have there. They're very impressive and also the uniform. Um, can you share with us how important this time of year is for the Armed Forces Christian Union, particularly as we mark Armistice Day and uh, Remembrance Sunday? Well, uh, Simon, thank you for having me uh, on your show. I think this time of year is uh, time for all of us, actually, just to pause and reflect on how we've got to where we are. We are currently in the middle of a global pandemic, the coronavirus. I think all of us have been reminded of our mortality, perhaps, in a way that uh, we not normally in our busy everyday lives. For us in the armed forces, this is particularly poignant. It's uh, alongside the Armed Forces Day is uh, one of those moments uh, where uh, we pause and, and we reflect and uh, there are many mixed emotions. Uh, obviously in August we had uh, the chaotic scenes as um, entitled personnel were evacuated from Kabul and the end of our 20 year campaign uh, came uh, rather abruptly and uh, that caused a lot of sort of reminiscence, a lot of mixed emotions for, for many of us. Um, and I think we, we often obviously uh, and rightly reflect back to the First World War where Armistice Day came from. And uh, you know this is the 103rd anniversary of that. That's where Remembrance Day really originated. But we've had an awful lot of conflict since then, including uh, the Second World War and, and many conflicts. Uh, I, I thankfully have not had uh, to go back twice to the same place, um, hence uh, quite a lot of medals for different operational tours uh, over, the, over the last 25, 30 years. Um, but it is a time just to pause and reflect. Uh, and um, Rhett, how important is it that, uh, that we um, remember Armistice Day and pause for a two minute silence as we remember the incredible sacrifice that was made um, during two world wars and also conflicts during the Gulf War, um, Afghanistan, Iraq. Uh, and is there not a danger now as that World War II generation dies out that we will forget the horrors of what happened during the First and the Second World War and, and, and therefore no longer hold Armistice Day and also Remembrance Sunday in the way that previous generations did? I think we have to um, think about the context of those two world wars. Uh, we clearly faced an existential threat to the way of life, uh, to our essentially our Judeo-Christian heritage background. And um, I think there was no doubt both uh, with the Axis forces um, in the First and Second World War that uh, they would have uh, treated us very differently had they successfully uh, invaded Britain and, and, and held Britain. I guess as well that back then you think the, the, just the army alone, and obviously I can speak confidently for the, for the army having sort of served uh, as a regular for 20 years anyways, 
that you know the army at the end of the first world war was five million strong out of a population of some uh, 30 or 40 million uh, that's a huge percentage and an awful lot of people lost loved ones in, in that conflict uh, and whilst we were not um, uh, relatively speaking so big in the in the second world war the, the battle there very much landed in uh, the united kingdom nowadays uh, those types of monolithic existential threats are not as obvious uh, they, they they are arguably out there and uh, we have a very uncomfortable relationship particularly with the russians um, uh, but probably with the chinese uh, but the threat is is much more subtle it's unseen it's uh, cyber warfare, potentially space, uh, some sort of conflict in space, uh, and in other ways that um, on our day-to-day -day in civilian life, we don't really think about or notice. So I think it is important to reflect on the evils of war, on the tragedy uh, of conflict, on lives lost. And I think um, history has shown again and again that if we don't learn from the past, we repeat the mistakes of the past. And um, Rhett, what would the Armed Forces Christian Union uh, be doing to mark both Armistice Day, uh, which is tomorrow at 11, p 11 a.m., and also Remembrance Sunday? So all, all sorts of things. Um, I am uh, personally involved in a uh, reflection space uh, uh, in the church. Not not for not that you have to be a Christian to come into the church for primary school kids tomorrow morning. Um, in the local Commonwealth War Graves uh, Commission um, a graveyard, which is uh, a few hundred metres from where I'm standing talking to you, uh, there'll be a small ceremony between about 10.30, 11.30, but obviously two minute silence at 11 o'clock. Um, on uh, Remembrance Sunday itself, I'll be speaking uh, again, another, uh, another small um, uh, prep school, um, uh, private school, uh, talking at their Sunday uh, chapel service and many many uh, serving particularly Christians because that is uh, where we are on Sundays is in church uh, who are in the armed forces many of our serving members and many of our veterans uh, are invited to give their reflections this time of year and we uh, are privileged and honoured to be able to do that and reflect on our service and what it all means and particularly hopefully uh, give it meaning in, in the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, amen to that, uh, Rhett. You've got you've got a Bible there that you can show us uh, from the uh, the First World War, which um, which is absolutely incredible, considering that it actually uh, shrapnel landed on um, Psalm ninety one. So, can you share with us uh, kind of the the background to this uh, kind of remarkable story, and also this yeah, remarkable certainly. Bible from the First World War? So this is, um, this is a Bible that was presented to our forebearers, the Officers Christian Union. Um, and uh, it was pre presented by a guy called, uh, well, he, he was re retired by then, but General uh, Sir Arthur Smith. And uh, Arthur Smith joined um, the army in, in 1910. He was the Sword of Honor winner, the best cadet at Sandhurst in 1910. Um, by 1914, he was an adjutant in the 3rd Battalion Grenadier Guards. He, uh, on, in uh, late November 1914, uh, was uh, out on patrol uh, or on a, a reconnaissance um, for a night move by his unit, and two German shells landed very close nearby. Uh, the second one picked him up and threw him across the road. And uh, as he was evacuated to the um, field dressing station with uh, minor uh, flesh wounds, um, uh, he was trying to work out how he had survived the blast and he remembered his uh, dad's Bible, which he read every day and had the tailor sew a pocket in the side of probably a uniform very similar to this in his uh, pocket and um, uh, realised that the, the, the Bible had taken the brunt of the, the, the force and the shrapnel. And then when he got to um, the field hospital, he pulled out his Bible and bearing in mind that when his dad gave it to him at the outbreak of war in August 14, um, uh, his dad on the flyleaf of, of the Bible had uh, annotated uh, a, a few verses from Psalm uh, 91, which is sometimes called the soldier's psalm. Um, the shrapnel actually had gone into his Bible and stopped at Psalm 91. Uh, in the middle of his Bible. And so uh, he 
felt God had honoured that. And he, he was a remarkable man. He uh, was mentioned in dispatches five times. He um, uh, was given various gallantry uh, awards. By the end of the war, he'd won the Distinguished Service Order. He had um, been presented a military cross uh, and the Croix de Guerre from the French. Um, and he went on in 1924 uh, to write a 100-day Bible study. And um, uh, we've republished it six times, most recently last year. Um, and that's um, a, a really in-depth uh, study of the Bible, bearing in mind long before you really had significant sort of uh, World Wide Web or anything else. And this has been used worldwide by many soldiers, uh, sailors and airmen throughout, uh, throughout the years, um, over 100, well, uh, nearly come, uh, 97 years now. Uh, so uh, he was a man who knew his Bible and uh, endeavoured to live his faith in the light of the revelation uh, in God's word. That, that's absolutely uh, inspirational there, um, Rhett. Absolutely incredible. So thank you uh, so much for sharing that incredible story. I, I know that you can't uh, talk about the EU army, but you can talk about the importance to uh, NATO and your experience of working under NATO command uh, for the defence of uh, Western Europe. Um, can you share with us how important NATO is to all of our defense and all of our security and the freedoms and the democracies, the democracy that we share across the Western world, also our ability to practice our, our Christian faith in relative peace in this time in which we're living in. Yes, thank you, Simon. Well, I've, I've deployed on a number of operations with NATO, including to uh, Kosovo in 99. Um, and I worked very closely with the US Marine Corps in 2011, 2012, this time uh, 10 years ago, I was uh, standing amongst um, three or 4,000 British soldiers for Remembrance Day, uh, which as you can imagine was very poignant at the time. Um, when we meet other uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, uh, there is a camaraderie. Uh, there is, uh, we are brothers and sisters in arms. Um, and there are many uh, very professional, some better, some worse, but very professional uh, armies out there. Um, I think as Christians, what's particularly encouraging is meeting Christians from, or seeing Christians from different sides. So I've seen a, uh, a couple of members of the Israeli Defense Force greeting every morning at a conference, the policemen from uh, the West Bank, uh, the Palestinian Authority. At the moment, every week, uh, uh, we have uh, friends one is Armenian and the other is Azerbaijani, uh, and obviously they had a conflict some just a few months ago, uh, quite a quite a bloody and savage short conflict. Uh, we've met Argentinians before, who obviously we had a conflict with in 1982. So I think um, NATO itself is a really good organisation. Uh, it's been a privilege uh, serving under command, um, and uh, it's very effective. Um, and uh, I think as, uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ, being able to meet and enjoy the freedoms, particularly in the West that we do, of uh, freedom of speech, freedom of practicing our faith um, and sharing our faith uh, is a great privilege and something that is good to remember the sacrifice of those of the past to enable that freedom and, and, and privilege to enjoy today. And uh, finally, Rhett, how, how can our viewers uh, watching behind the headlines tonight um, support the incredible work that you and your colleagues do at the Armed Forces Christian Union um, to support acting, active Christians who are serving today, whether that's in the Navy, whether that's in the Army, or whether that is actually in the Air Force? Uh, thank you, Simon. Well, uh, if you uh, want to pray for us, we will... Uh, um... We obviously are all engaged in a spiritual fight and prayer is how we fight. And therefore, I would encourage uh, all of you, wherever you are uh, and whatever you think of um, a conflict, war, uh, Christians in the armed forces to pray for us. We need your prayers. Do please go online and Google the Armed Forces Christian Union uh, or email us uh, office at afcu.org.uk. We'd love to hear from you. There's lots online about how you can pray specifically for us, how you can support serving Christians. Uh, and even in uh, the wider churches, we're just launching a, an initiative called Veteran Friendly Church. And you may know some veterans who probably need uh, prayer, particularly if they have had any moral or physical uh, injury and trauma from combat. Uh, and we can help you to get alongside them, which would be a, a great opportunity. 
So, uh, Major uh, Rhett Parkinson, it's been an absolute pleasure to host you on Behind the Headlines and uh, pray that, uh, the, that tomorrow goes very well for you for Armistice Day and uh, Remembrance Sundays. We remember the incredible sacrifice that was paid for our freedom during the First and the Second World War and also in modern conflicts. Well, thank you very much to Major Rhett Parkinson uh, and to Simon. Um, very, very inspirational interview. What a story um, about that guy being saved with Psalm 91 there in, in the Bible, um, in his heart. That's amazing. Uh, John has written, I believe it's clear both world wars and many other historical events have been engineered for specific reasons. And uh, John, here's the reality of it. God has allowed our human sin to be the catalyst through which He has worked to accomplish His perfect plan and purpose. Uh, there is just war. That is a tragic reality of this fallen world. But God works in and through the tragedies and triumphs of history to accomplish His great and perfect purposes. And um, we were just talking a minute ago, Simon, about how actually it was through all of these scenarios that God was paving away, also for the creation of um, the state, or recreation, shall we say, of the state of Israel. Absolutely. It's I mean, that couldn't have happened without the collapse of the Ottoman Empire at the hands of the British. It wouldn't have happened if the, uh, the British and the Anzac forces hadn't liberated uh, Jerusalem from um, the uh, from the Ottomans, um, and then again in the Second World War as well. So we see the hand of God over history because history is His story. Now, all of us who are aware of uh, Bible prophecy, and uh, many of us, uh, I certainly take the position. I believe that the European Union will be the last and final world empire. Um, which makes that uh, seven-year peace treaty with Israel. An important part of, uh, of Europe is the formation of a European army. Now, this is something, as we said prior to the program, that Napoleon tried to pursue. We also see that uh, Imperial Germany during the First World War tried to unite Europe, and, and so did Hitler as well, want to establish a unified, Germ a unified Europe under German Nazi control. So again, we're seeing that the European Union is trying to do this in peace, but they have a, a new... Um, a new leader to spearhead that, and that's uh, the French President uh, Macron. And uh, many are saying that this will actually, if this does go ahead, this could potentially undermine NATO, which is the North American Atlantic Treaty Organization that underpins Western security and Western defense. Uh, many EU nations are very concerned with these plans because they feel that an EU army will not be equipped as NATO to defend Europe. Um, because they can see Eastern European states see the emergence of uh, aggression coming from Russia. Um, and we've already seen that in the Ukraine in the past year. So we have to really understand why is Macron talking up the need for Europe to have its own army and uh, how that uh, Europe needs to be um, self-reliant and not dependent upon the United States. We need to um, go back, as you indicated, and look at the trajectory that's uh, occurred that's led us to this place. Emmanuel Macron, uh, understand viewers, w will be essentially the de facto uh, leader of the, the EU, uh, as Merkel is... If he gets re-elected in April. True. Um, it, presidential elections. Exactly. And, uh, you know, th that might happen. It looks likely, I think, that... Um, he will. Um, there are a couple of things that could disrupt that. But uh, with Merkel leaving, now we're going to have potentially Macron as um, the leader of this initiative. And France has always been very significant in uh, the development of this idea. You mentioned Napoleon. He spoke of Europe being divided into nationalities freely formed and free internally, peace between states uh, becoming easier. And he actually coined this um, expression. I believe he was the first to use it. Um, he, he said the United States of Europe would become a possibility. 
Um, so th this is something that has a rooting going back. Victor Hugo, his um, compatriot, spoke of uh, the United States of Europe during a speech at the International Peace uh, Congress in Paris in 1849. He was very happy with this idea of what he called a supreme sovereign senate, which will be to Europe what Parliament is to England. So what's interesting is that um, England was never really considered as, as part of this. Parliament had its significance um, for England, but um, th this idea of the United States of Europe didn't include England uh, by some of the original uh, propagators and promoters of this uh, concept. He said, a day will come when all nations on our continent will form a European brotherhood. A day will come when we shall see the United States of America and the United States of Europe face to face, reaching out for each other across the seas. And fast forward, you have um, Churchill speaking as well um, in the same terms of, um, United, uh, of a United States of Europe. He used that term in his speech in 1946 in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, there were individuals out of Nazi Germany as the Nazis were taking over vast swaths of Europe. Uh, one Wilhelm II said, the hand of God, the, the, you know, definitely used and abused um, re religion and used the name of God in vain in this case, is creating a new world and working miracles. Uh, and I, I agree, he was creating a new world in and, and through this he was preparing the way uh, in a particular way, not as Wilhelm and the Nazis thought perhaps at the time. We are becoming the United States of Europe under German leadership a united European continent. Um, and, and so th there was this idea that continued to develop and, until actually 1950, post-World War II, um, it was increasingly solidified. And in 1952, there were actually documents drawn up, though never ratified, um, that would lead to a European army. Uh, which, which is incredible. So, I mean, the big question for our viewers is, why are we discussing this tonight? Uh, why is this uh, a cause for concern and why is this a cause for alarm? Primarily because what we're seeing really with the whole European project is move towards a European super state. It's a gradual step ever since the uh, Treaty of Rome was signed in 52. Uh, the Europe's plan has always been to create a European super state. Um, stage by stage and uh, for the agenda for the European Union in going into the 2020s was the establishment of a European army. Now many people think uh, that uh, the prospect of Europe being able to create a European army is something that, that is, is, is ridiculous. Remainers campaigned when, um, when Brexiteers brought this up at the referendum said this, this is a joke you can't, uh, you can't take the uh, the, the Brexiteers seriously on this issue. This is make-believe, but we now see clearly that Macron is really pushing for this under the tame of European autonomy from the United States. So we found many factors that, uh, that are pushing Europe in this direction, but ultimately this would um, diminish NATO's role and responsibility. It means that we'd no longer be reliant upon the United States, who has been the bulwark of our security and has come to the defence of Europe on three occasions in the last century, during the First World War, the Second World War, and also during the Cold War, and kept the Soviet threat at bay. Um, and now Europe, with well, the Federalists, want to push through this idea of a European army because it's the next stage in creating a European super state. Just a reminder to our viewers, we are live, we are interactive. The question we're asking this evening is, will an EU army lead to a European super state? Now, Simon, there are many who have dismissed this idea of a uh, European army. There are many who have dismissed this idea of uh, the United States of Europe. Even um, one of our former very prominent politicians, Nick Clegg, really rubbished it, saying it was nonsense and um, dismissed it as something that no one would really support and no one was trying to support. But we've already shown how history 
actually is filled with people, including our um, um, dearly beloved Winston Churchill speaking almost positively of um, the United States of, of Europe, though probably without the sight of the consequences um, that, that are in view, um, which we're discussing. But in recent days, despite opposition from some, there have been many in the EU who have troublingly expressed support for this idea, well, whether it's due to a lack of um, responsibility, a lack of care for their own uh, national sovereignty, borders, a lack of patriotism, a lack of national identity. We can't forget that uh, many of the borders were completely changed post um, both World War I and World War II. So a lack of some national identity perhaps may uh, have opened the door for this. But um, so we've talked about Macron, we've talked about Merkel having suggested, uh, well, having expressed adamant support for a joint European army. Other European politicians who've expressed support include uh, former um, French Prime Minister Alain Juppé, former Italian Prime Minister um, Silvio Berlusconi, though I don't know if that's exactly a, a, a credible uh, endorsement that anyone is going to take seriously, Ho hopefully not. Um, but uh, more credibly for the EU, um, perhaps, would be the um, European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker, um, former Czech Prime Minister's um, as well, uh, and the current Hungarian Prime Minister, I was surprised a little bit by this, um, Viktor Orban has expressed uh, support for a European army. And um, it is also on the official program of the European People's Party as well. So um, th there's, there is some support that it's gaining. What do you think, do, do you think there's support among the citizens of these nations? Uh, no, no, of course not. Of course there's not support this one because no. effectively, I mean, the problem is, okay, let, let's, let's take, for example, uh, Poland, for example, which is now fast becoming the, becoming or having the second largest army uh, in Europe, that um, the EU sets up its uh, plan and it first wants to start off with a, a EU rapid deployment force mm. of uh, 5,000 soldiers uh, and then build towards a European army. Now, the problem comes if there's a conflict around the world and you're calling upon your nationals in Poland or in Spain or in Italy or in France to go and fight a cause that the EU thinks that we, we need military, EU military intervention in this case. Um, how is a nation like Spain or Italy or Hungary or Poland going to respond when one of their soldiers is killed in that conflict? dying on path of the European Union. So yeah. that, is, that is the major problem they have, is that no one at the moment is prepared to die for the European Union. Um, people will die for the nation state um, and defend the nation state and the interests of the, of the nation state. But when it comes to the European Union, they're not ready to do that yet. Um, so that's a major, major um, hurdle. <laughs> hurdle for the European Union, but, but the European Union and its federalists have never cared about this. I mean, take, for example, the euro. The euro economically doesn't actually work. It wasn't set up on economic principles. It was mm. set up on political principles to form a, late, a, a single European currency and a European economy um, so that Europe could move closer towards European integration. And the same is with this European army proposal. They want this European army because it's the next step to creating a United States of Europe. We have a few emails um, here. I'll read a couple of these. Um, we have from Anita. Hi, Simon and Reagan. It's always lovely to see you both. We look forward to your program every week. That's nice. Thank you, Anita. I'm not the biggest fan of President Macron. Uh, from what I have read, Angela Merkel doesn't appear to be keen on the idea of this army. The problem is that with the threat that is posed by Russia and China and having President Biden in office, the EU are feeling vulnerable. It wouldn't surprise me if we don't end up with an EU super state. It seems as if things are heading this way. Uh, we know it will come, so we need to heed God's words. Matthew 24, 44, therefore be also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Blessings, Anita. Uh, now, I, I would say, um, Anita, Angela Merkel has expressed support 
um, to, to a degree for this idea, though I think it's unlikely that she will be um, be spearheading any move towards it. Um, so she has expressed support um, in that way, though she won't be spearheading that. We have to eye Macron more um, in that regard. A question here, Simon. This is from Tom. Who will the EU army ultimately end up fighting? Well, that's a big question, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, that, that is the, the million dollar question. And if you look at EU foreign policy, um, we know that uh, that's not a very good indication. We know that the EU is incredibly hostile towards Israel, very, very pro-Palestinian. So could we see a future uh, European uh, super state um, declare war on Israel? Uh, we also know that uh, they're very much um, aligned themselves with the extremist Islamist forces across the Middle East and Central Asia, um, together with very, a close relationship with the Iranian regime. So, you know, we, we could find ourselves that the European Union is on the side of, of the Iranian mullahs, um, which is actually preposterous when we know that the Europe is supposed to be democratic, but the whole of the EU's institutions has a democratic deficit attached to it mm. because it is not driven by man's ideas. We're dealing with principalities and powers of darkness. Mm. And we know that Satan has always wanted to uh, unite Europe into one single entity. And then by creating an army, you have the power to back up what you want politically. Um, the difference is with the different member states, with, we have different objectives. They have um, different strategic um, needs and aspirations. So therefore, they are concerned about going in this direction, but the Federalists within the EU have never cared about that. They just want to create a European super state and they see this is the next stage. They see Macron as becoming a possibly future leader of the entire European project. Um, and that really depends whether he gets elected, re-elected back in April mm. uh, next year. And if he doesn't, then Europe's in serious trouble then. Now, Simon, you and I are both uh, lovers of history. We uh, enjoy looking and uh, at, at identifying the patterns throughout it. One of the things that I find very fascinating about the EU, even when we were having our conversations about Brexit and whatnot, um, it seems ages ago now, um, we, we you, you can identify some very big players throughout history across Europe who are essentially still the ones holding the keys to power today namely Germany, um, and I already quoted Wilhelm II, who believed that as Nazi Germany was flourishing, it was in control. Um, some years ago, I was visiting uh, a country that applied for membership of the EU, um, Albania, and it, I found it fascinating how much German control there was in Albania and in talking with various others, uh, visiting other spots, um, other poor countries across Europe, Inarguably, Germany has massive control and uh, up to this point has enjoyed massive control in leading the EU. Um, but now it may be that the balance of power is shifting a little bit because France seems to, being one of the other key players in, in history in Europe, um, coming into its own once more and gaining a bit more control and power. Macron is um, stepping out in uh, very bold ways, um, not bold in a good way, but bold in, um, in the way that he's aiming to lead this project. Um, but what's fascinating is alongside those, you of course have Britain. Britain has always been there, but Britain has never been truly European. It's been its own entity. So I, I mentioned Churchill earlier, and he didn't see anything wrong with um, Europe enjoying what he called um, contented European commonality. But he clarified Britain would not have any role in this situation. He said, we have our own dream and our own task. We are with Europe, but not of it. We are linked, but not compromised. We are interested and associated, but not absorbed. Now, he said that because Britain was an empire still. Exactly. So there's, it, there, was, there was a difference. Would after, you say we're after different after now? After the 1960s, uh, the, the empire, British empire essentially collapsed. 
uh, and therefore Britain just became uh, an island and uh, therefore was in pretty much economic dire straits. I saw how much the, uh, the continent was, was booming under the US Marshall mm. aid plan uh, and br various British prime ministers wanted to be part of that but it was actually um, um, the French president at, at the time, I um, can't remember his name, uh, de Gaulle, that actually prevented Britain's entry into uh, Europe. But I think this also plays a part in that God has historic role yep. for Britain, that to be an island it is deliberate. The, the fact is that we've got um, the sea separating us from the European continent it is, is by grand design, not default. Mm. Uh, and Britain's spiritual role, I think, has always been to prevent the establishment before its time of a European empire. Uh, across Europe. I mean, we saw God's miraculous intervention during the Napoleonic Wars, again in the First World War, and then again in the Second World War. And of course, the United States has played a major role in that in the last century. Um, but going back to your question of, of power and this power shift in the European Union with Macron, um, it's the Germans that are driving the European economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and the French are in charge of EU foreign policy. So what Macron is wanting to do now is to make sure that France is actually controlling EU military planning policy to push this forward. And this has also came out of the context of the debacle that was the US withdrawal from Afghanistan mm -hmm. and the question marks hanging over the Biden administration, can they actually trust the Americans? Uh, if the, the Russians invade the Ukraine, will America's part of its um, agreements with NATO come to the defence of the Ukraine and Eastern Europe. And these are the big questions that, that uh, Europe are fearing, that Macron is fearing, and he feels the only way that, uh, that Europe can have its independence from Europe, the only way that uh, Europe can grow into a European superstate is if it creates its own army. So we began to see Macron escalating things um, during Trump's tenure, but he, he's been dealt a really humiliating blow by the Biden administration. Uh, in September 2021, Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States announced a new tripartite strategic alliance aimed at countering China's growing assertiveness in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, adding insult to injury, Australia announced that as part of the um, US deal, it had canceled a multi-billion dollar submarine contract. Uh, once dubbed the contract of the century, under which France was to supply Australia with 12 diesel-powered submarines. I'm sure many of you viewers came across this in the news. It's very, very recent. Instead, Australia has said that it will be buying nuclear submarines now from the United States. The uh, French foreign minister called AUKUS a stab in the back. Uh, the French ambassador to Australia, Jean-Pierre Thibault, said that Australia's decision to cancel the submarine deal was akin to, quote, treason. Uh, really, really strong words there. Now, this humiliation has set Macron into uh, um, a seeming rage and appears to be fueling his increasingly frenzied calls for strategic autonomy. An advisor to Macron said, we could turn a blind eye and act as if nothing had happened. We think that would be a mistake for all Europeans. There really is an opportunity here. So far, however, only Italy and Greece have come out in support really of um, this call for an autonomous EU military force. Um, so it, it will need more support. Uh, they can gain that support. Certainly if uh, Macron can um, highlight and in some way finagle in dealings with showing that there are threats and um, if he can try to get people's backs up against the US and against the, the Australians in regard to this, um, this act of treason as he's called it. Well look what he said in, um, this is what uh, Macron said on November the 6th uh, 2018 that was marking the centenary of the uh, armistice that ended the First World War. He said that he warned that Europe uh, could not be protected without a true European army. He added that we have to protect ourselves with respect to China, Russia and even uh, the United States. Incredible.
Okay, so um, we have a few emails here. Many modern historians believe World War I and World War II were the same war with a 20-year halftime. Interesting perspective, and I, I, I think you could probably write a decent essay that I makes have that heard, I have heard that. H have you written an essay as well? I've written an essay on that one, but I have, I have yeah. actually heard that, that uh, historical argument. It, it makes it. sense, and um, some believe it's also a carry-on of the Prussian-French War of the 1850s, and um, to be honest, you can go back to the 1800s and you can track the uh, routings of World War I in all of the deals that were being made and treaties being made um, in, in the 1800s. We have this from Robert. God bless, gentlemen. Britain must stay out of Europe as we must be flexible and ready to support Israel at the drop of a hat. And Indeed, we came out of the EU. And we've had Brexit now, um, but we must um, not in any way become absorbed through um, su such an alliance or anything with the uh, uh, an EU initiative for an army. Is EU the latest attempt at a German European empire? Interesting question. I would have said um, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, that uh, in some ways Germany may have gotten what it wanted um, in the end through the EU. That is a lot of control over vast swaths of Europe. Um, what, what do you think on that, Simon? Is the EU the latest attempt at a German European empire? I, I, I think Germany's struggling. I mean, if you right. look at their military, um, only, uh, I mean, in terms of, according to my notes here, that uh, NATO requires that, uh, for example, there should be 80 military aircraft that are combat ready. So um, Germany has the Eurofighter and, and so does Britain, but currently Germany only has four uh, combat aircraft that are actually military operational. So um, Germany's not really in a fit military state. Um, they have uh, very, very concerned about building up an army because of the way that Germany is perceived after the First and the Second World War. So I don't think this is going to come from Germany so much. But, but it's also interesting to note that it, it will probably take a major crisis that will actually unite uh, uh, and push through the whole concept of a European army, whether that's the decline of the United States on the world stage, uh, a growing and belligerent Russia and China, could actually force Europe closer together. So if people feel across Europe that there's an existential threat posed by the Russians or posed by the Chinese, that might be enough to trigger uh, the EU to create its own European army. But that can only actually mm. work if there is a United States or Europe. Mm. So the two go hand in hand. You can't have uh, national states who then say, no, sorry, I'm not willing to, uh, to surrender my uh, countrymen to fight in uh, a war uh, that the EU believes is a just war and wants to pursue because we don't, I don't want this to have an electoral impact on my, uh, on my election. Uh, this is what you can say with a lot of European leaders across Europe saying the same sort of thing. So it can only really come about by authoritarian means. I mean, we, uh, I mean, I remember reading an article in the Telegraph not long ago when the uh, Polish prime minister said that Europe has two options. Europe can either disintegrate as the European Union and many countries will leave the EU like Britain has, including Poland, or that Europe unites under an authoritarian dictatorship. And yet Poland, uh, it's, I mean, those are significant words because Poland is actually opposed to this idea of um, a, an EU army because it would weaken the armies of NATO's member states. Now, Poland plans to double the size of its own armed forces to 250,000 soldiers and 50,000 reserves. Uh, the expansion was announced on the 26th of October, so it's brand new news, um, it will make the Polish military the second largest in Europe, which is quite significant. I mean, it's a massive leap up from where they are now. Uh, it's ahead of that which we have here in the United Kingdom. In January of 2020, Poland signed a contract worth $4.6 billion to purchase 32 F-35A fighter jets from the United States. So um, Poland is ramping up its power as well in um, regards to military might. But I mean, one has to ask, Simon, 
Uh, what are they getting ready for, right? Uh, I think they're getting very scared about the, uh, the Russian threat. I mean, mm. we saw earlier back in May the uh, massive expansion of uh, Russian troops on, on Ukraine's border. Um, so they are getting very concerned about uh, Russia flexing its military muscles in Eastern Europe. So that's the primary concern, I think, for Eastern European countries. Don't forget, they are newly independent states uh, and they were controlled by the Soviet Union. It was only the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 uh, that granted many of these European countries their, their, their nation statehood again, their independence, their freedom, their democracy. And they're not going to surrender it now either to Russia or to the European Union. Um, and, there's a sh and they are becoming more and more powerful uh, as Europe is, is torn apart. And it very much reflects the, um, the prophecy made uh, that Daniel uh, received uh, with, a v with the vision of, um, Nebuch that Nebuchadnezzar had of the big statue. Mm. Um, the, uh, the head was representing Babylon and uh, the stomach was representing the, uh, was it the Persian Empire, then the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire. And finally, the last power would be a mixture of clay and iron. Uh, and this is what we have very much with the European Union. It's strong, but it's also extremely weak and very fragile. Uh, and it's very difficult to mix clay with iron as the, the, the final world empire. So potentially we, we could see the complete collapse of the United States as a world power, uh, which would then kind of destroy NATO. Uh, we could also see maybe the actual the rapture of, of the church uh, and with that the loss of the United States as a world power uh, and that Europe would have no other choice but to push through a military agenda in order to create a United States of Europe. But, but we know that a United States of Europe is coming, whether it's tomorrow or, or whether it's a decade's time, it, it's certainly going to be on the agenda. This is what a senior Tory MP, Bob Seeley, has warned. If the EU army undermines NATO or results in the separation of the US and Europe or produces a paper army, Europe will be committing the most enfeebling and dangerous act of self-harm since the rise of fascism in the 1930s. An EU army will amount to European de-arming. So uh, there are many out there who are strongly critiquing um, this re this coming reality. But Simon, as we begin to draw the program to a close, we're not surprised. We're not surprised that um, there's a, an EU army forming. We're not surprised when we hear of rumors of this, that, and the other, of, of wars or rumors of wars, because it's exactly what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ promised there would be. So I want to, um, from, from my part anyway, uh, remind our viewers of the promises of Jesus Christ. And take some time maybe this evening as we finish the program to um, read Matthew chapter 24. Jesus says, many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. These things must happen, but the end is still to come. He speaks of nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, earthquakes in various places. All of these things are, are going to be going on and will be continuing and increasing. You will be experiencing very frightening things. This is the world in which we live. And we've been talking about um, the climate change and various things as well go going on. We've been talking about um, wars. We've been talking about um, corrupt politicians. All of that's to be expected to some degree and even more than we're experiencing now. It, get, yeah, it, it, does, it does get worse. Um, but then we see Jesus delivers his people. Absolutely. We see our Lord and Savior returns in victory and triumph. And that's the hope that we have. So viewers, um, look to Jesus Christ. Consider he is coming again. He is, um, he, he is aware. He knows the situation our world is in. Do not let your hearts be troubled. The scriptures t tell us to not be afraid. Do not be afraid um, for the Lord your God is with you. And as we uh, approach our mystic state, let's be grateful. 
Let's be grateful for um, those who died, who gave of their own lives, who sacrificed themselves so that we might enjoy um, the freedoms that we've enjoyed up to this moment. Um, take some time to remember them even tomorrow, and let's make sure that we don't forget their sacrifice. Well, um, Simon and I um, wish you a very good evening and good night. We hope you have a blessed rest of the week, and we'll see you next week on Behind the Headlines.